Hey everyone, welcome back and if you are new here, on this channel I interview the brightest minds of physical therapy. So if you want to improve your knowledge and learn from the best PTs out there, start right now by subscribing to this channel and clicking on the bell so you don't miss anything. And please give us a thumbs up and share this video with other colleagues. Today our guest is Kimberly Painter and she is going to talk about how to apply craniosacral therapy to the conception, pregnancy, labor, delivery and the postpartum period. She is a PT with over 30 years of experience and she is an instructor at the Upledger Institute. I hope you enjoyed the show. Hi Kim, welcome to PT Pro Talk. How are you today? I'm well, Mariana. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for accepting my invitation. So I'm let's excited to be here. Nice. I'm excited for our conversation. So you're going to bring some different topics today. So could you tell us a little bit about yourself, your career, and how did you get to where you are right now? So I come from a very medically oriented family. My dad's a trauma specialist. My mom's an RN. My grandfather's a vet. All my uncles are dentists or doctors. And it just was part of my growing up having medical conversations at the dinner table, um, much to my husband's dismay when he joined the family. And so I knew I wanted to go into something medically oriented. And I um, decided on physical therapy. I went to Northwestern University in Chicago, got an excellent education. And from there, I, I was always interested in working with kids. I'm one of seven kids. And so I, my first job was in a pediatric hospital. And um, while I was in school, I also did an OBGYN elective just fascinated with the whole process of pregnancy, working with children, um, I loved doing that. And so um, after I worked in the hospital, pediatric hospital, I worked in the school system for a while until I had my own kids and I had four, I have four kids. Then I was just trying to figure out really how, it wasn't like I was focused on going back to work after the birth of my last child, but I was determined I was keeping my license current and so um, I was looking for some continuing education where I was and cranial one was being offered close by and I took that. And I, I had a pretty significant experience of having gone injured myself to the class. I had an accident a couple of days before the class. And so what I felt and experienced in that class, particularly as they were mobilizing my sacrum, I'd fallen backwards out of my car getting my baby out of the car seat and I hit my butt on the curb and I down my sacrum really bad. I had learned at school how to decompress the sacrum and it's very physical for the therapist. But when I was in this cranial one class, very gently with five grams, this woman, a massage therapist had my, her hand under my sacrum and was just gently decompressing it. And I literally felt my sacrum decompressed in a very different way from what I'd learned in school. And so after that class, I came back home and I was just on fire to practice this. I was fascinated with it. And so then um, you had to do, there's a requirement that we have at the Appalachian Institute for completing a certain number of practice sessions before you move on to the next class. So I was just doing my practice session. And within about six weeks, I had people that I didn't know starting to call me and say, hey, I heard from so-and-so that this is what you did. Could you do that on me? And so I went and registered a practice and that's how I started my practice um, at that point with the kids at home. And so um, I, that's what I was doing for 27, well, 23 years and it's been since I went to that first cranial one class. So that's kind of how I got um, interested in cranial sacral therapy and then just continued in private practice. And recently I just moved from Texas where I lived for 27 years to Utah, where I will continue to work as a cranial sacral therapist in my son's chiropractic office. So that's how I got here. Nice, that's a nice story and always usually involves someone's experience, our own experience, and then exactly. like the desire of trying to do something like that, that happens to me as well. And I think with probably many therapies and the right. 
this like desire to learn wow how that works that's amazing then you get fascinated about it and then you go after to try to right and when we experience like something ourselves when we have a need for some help ourselves then we're highly motivated to find that help and yeah. um along the way because of my own health issues and um my quest for finding out how to get better with some things that I had going on. I did go on and get a master's degree in natural health. And um, that was really interesting coming from a very traditional medical family on the one hand, then going to a natural health perspective. And, you know, sacral therapy just kind of was like the bridge between the two. So it's been, a, it has been an interesting journey. So I know that you have many tools on your toolbox. And could you tell us um, what other techniques you use and how they complement each other on your practice? Yes. So um, because of where I lived in Texas, um, I know this might be a little controversial for some PTs, but I did actually go back and get a massage license for having a little bit more open access to therapy. I was 95% of what I was doing was cranial sacral therapy um, after 1998. In that first prenatal circle therapy class. And so um, I felt comfortable doing that under the massage license and having my clients be able to come on a little bit more flexible time frame than what I could under my PT license. And so I do have that massage license. I learned how to do Thai massage. Um, I learned Wa Sha, so some different manual therapy tools related more to massage. I never have um, done like a, a regular Swedish massage on any of my clients. Once I got out of school, I was done with that. Um, I appreciate it, but it wasn't an avenue that I wanted to go down. But having that open access was my primary reason for getting my massage license. Um, and then the master's in natural health. So I looked at homeopathy and aromatherapy and um, just different types of movement. So um, Feldenkrais and things like that, that I don't know a ton about. You know, I would never say I'm an expert in any of those modalities or therapies, but I know enough to be able to help direct clients to them if it seems like that, it would be helpful for them. You know, all of our clients respond differently to different modalities. And so if you only have one tool in your toolbox, then you're not gonna be able to help as many people. Um, the most recent tool that I've added to my toolbox is I just, during the pandemic, I had lots of time, like most of us, and so I completed my lactation education because I work with so many moms and babies with breastfeeding issues and latch issues, and I totally have the manual therapy aspect of that down and being able to help when there's a physical restriction on either side, especially on babies, though. Um, but I really wanted to have that lactation perspective on maybe what's been going, what might be going on with the milk production, connection between the two. So I've added that lactation training in as well as my most recent tool. That's nice. I think that's important. Always adding these tools and being able right. to help more people, right? So right. I think that's- Round out your, what makes you understand what you're doing better. You know, yeah. like I said, I can look at a baby and see if there's a restriction at the hyoid or at their occipital cranial base and tell how that's gonna have an impact on their ability to suck or latch. If they're latching okay and there's still a problem, I needed that other perspective. So it was very motivating to me to help these babies. I'm curious to talk about that. You're going to get to that just in a second. So uh, you have learned and specialized in cranial sacral therapy for the last 22 years, right? Correct. Uh, and could you tell us um, how has this journey been? Sure. Um, so actually, when I was in school, um, PT school at Northwestern University, it was I was there in 85. And John Upledger, who's considered the father of cranial sacral therapy, was doing his research up at Michigan State in the 10, eight to 10 years prior to me getting to Northwestern. And so I remember in school, in my musculoskeletal class, 
my two professors were introducing this new cranial sacral system, newly discovered cranial sacral therapies or cranial sacral system in the body. And I was thinking, this is 1985. How can there be a new system in the body that we hadn't fully identified yet? Um, but there it was. And um, so in that two hour lecture, they just talked about the anatomy and physiology of the system and about this cranial rhythm. And that night I was on my bed studying as every PT student does every night. And I felt this rhythm in my body. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I think that's what they were talking about today. And I was really interested and fascinated with that. And so um, I thought then someday I'm going to learn more about this. <laughs> 11 years and four kids and I moved to Texas. And that's when I was needing to renew my license. And so I was looking for the continuing education class. So I was really excited when I found out the cranial one was going to be offered close by. And then um, I was reading the prerequisite material and I was thinking, okay, this is a little far out. I don't know about this, but Texas is gonna give me credit. I'm gonna take the class. Well, it was two days before that class and that I fell out of the car and sprained my ankle and I couldn't sit and I couldn't, I was on crutches. <laughs> I was like, Oh boy, this is going to be interesting. But I, I'm grateful in a way because I really did experience what it felt like to receive this therapy from, from a need point, not just a curiosity point. And so, like I said, I was on fire after that, thinking I want to learn more about this. And so went home, was practicing, started getting those phone calls, started my practice. And I was work. I had four little kids at home. So I was working out of my house and um, during nap time or after bedtime. And over the years, it just grew until I had more clients than I could handle at any one time. I had a pretty continuous waiting list. But it just was amazing to me to shift from that more traditional PT where PT perspective of me needing to know what tests to do, what treatments to do, how to help this person get better. Um, actually, at Northwestern, our class motto was find it, fix it, and leave it alone once you've fixed it. And I, so I went from that mindset to a more, a different perspective within the cranial sacral paradigm of really looking at this person as a body that knew how to self-correct. And the only thing I have to do is support that self-correcting ability, either offering extra resources or my knowledge of anatomy, physiology, what tissues should feel like, what can help strengthen them, what can help stretch them, bringing all of that that I know as a PT, but supporting their ability to do what their body knows how to do to heal way better than I know. You know, all of us are carrying things around through our whole life of physical, emotional, mental, spiritual experiences that have an impact on our physical body. And so to think that we can see a client for an hour and know everything that's gone into creating this challenge that they're experiencing in that moment is really um, not necessarily accurate. You know, there's a lot that goes into what brings us each to the point where we come in contact with our clients that we don't know. And I used to really stress about, okay, I have to know, I have to be able to fix them. Whereas with, within the cranial sacral therapy paradigm, you are facilitating their ability to self-correct. You're empowering them to, with knowledge, with touch, with encouragement, with um, dialogue within themselves to be able to self-correct. And that changed everything for me. Yeah, that's a completely, completely different way to, to see, approach, and treat patients, right? Than the exactly. traditional therapy. So it's a completely different approach, and it's a much, much, much more effective approach. Because when you can engage that person's ability to self-correct, they get better. Versus me saying, mm, you know, I think you need 10 more reps of that ankle exercise to get that stretched out. It's a completely different thing. That's very interesting, very interesting. And now connecting your cranial sacral experience to um, 
conception and pregnancy. So how can you apply the cranial cycle therapy to that topic? Okay. Um, this is one of my favorite things. I, I work with all populations, but working with um, conception, pregnancy, birth, and postpartum is one of the most magical, amazing, miraculous, miraculous uh, populations that we can work with. So when you're using cranial cycle therapy, or con let's talk about conception first. So there can be physical restrictions that are creating fertility challenges. So let's say you play, you were a cross country runner as a woman, as a teenage girl in high school, you were a cross country runner and you had a fall and your pelvis got shifted. And so say one ilium was forward, one ilium was back and it was going over a long time and you're still running and you're kind of building compensation patterns within that. The way the uterus is held within the pelvic bowl with all of the many ligaments that support it and hold it in there, it actually can literally get shifted to one side or the other. It can get tilted forward or tilted back and held in those positions which is going to impact its ability to have a comfortable menstrual cycle, to be able to conceive um, those fascial restrictions, those ligament connective tissue restrictions can impact function in that way. So there's lots of ways you can come in with manual therapy, including cranial cycle therapy to rebalance um, gain more symmetry of the uterine position. That's just one example. So there can be physical um, restrictions that are creating fertility challenges. And that actually can be on both sides. Um, I've worked with men who had challenges, physical re restrictions within their reproductive system that, that were creating functional challenges leading to infertility. So from a purely physical um, perspective, we can make a change. We can facilitate hormonal um, balance going from the pituitary, the hypothalamus, pineal glands, where those reproductive hormones are being produced, but they have to get down to the pelvis to impact the end organs that they need to impact. And so you can work with balancing out the hormonal system, the endocrine system, that can make a big difference. There also can be emotional or stress-related challenges to infertility. It's Most of us have heard stories of people who are trying and trying and trying to conceive and then finally realize it's not gonna happen for us. We're just gonna let that go and then they get pregnant, right? So there's this huge emotional stress component to wanting to conceive, not being able to conceive. And, and there can be a lot of experiences that we've had in our life that can contribute to some of that emotional, um, I'll call it a restriction, a challenge that is creating a physical challenge with conception. And so one of the things I love about cranial cycle therapy is that it accesses where in our bodies we are holding emotions. If you read Candace Pert's book, Molecules of Emotion, she realized emotions really are physiological events. And we store mostly our negative emotions in our tissues. And it's funny because I've never yet come across a client who was holding a pocket of joy somewhere in their body that they didn't want to let themselves feel. We let ourselves feel the, the positive emotions, but those negative ones, we tend to, to not want to feel. And so we stuff them in our body and they get stored there until you can come along with, and, and there are different modalities. Cranial cycle therapy is my modality of choice for accessing that emotional, um, restrictions or imprints in the tissue, but there are other ones as well. Um, but you can come in and help shift how our bodies are holding our story in our tissues in a way that can be more functional. So that can be a huge part of conception, our fertility challenges as well. So that's how we can help conception. During pregnancy, again, there can be physical restrictions and um, at the after we finish talking about this, I do have some images that can show. There's one slide that shows a woman that I was working with where you can see that at her pelvis, it's flat and then there's a rather steep angle. And then you can see 
a little bit of her pregnant belly, but there's a significant restriction there. So I worked on her that day that I took that picture. And then the following week she came in and you see this nice smooth rounded belly through the whole thing. That physical restriction that was impeding the growth of her uterus and the baby um, was released. So that's gonna be much more comfortable for mom, much more comfortable for baby and allow for a more um, effective, efficient, functional, healthy pregnancy to ensue. So there's those kind of physical restrictions. We can just help mom and baby both be more comfortable. My favorite part though, of working with a pregnant woman is that you can facilitate communication between mom and baby. And not from mom looking at her belly on the outside and saying, oh, hi, baby, I'm glad you're in there. But literally coming from the inside and helping mom and baby communicate with each other. Um, if you look at material from APA, which is the Association of Pre and Perinatal Psychology and Health, we're learning more and more and more about how conscience, conscious and sentient embryos, fetuses, and newborns are. They're aware of things of that's going around um, them in their environment, external environment to mom, internal environment with mom. They're swimming in mom's emotional soup. So they know everything that's going on with mom and they respond to it. And so by helping mom and baby learn how to communicate with each other on the inside, you are facilitating a lifelong relationship of being able to hear each other and communicate with each other on a subtle level. So I've worked with lots of lots of moms and babies, but lots of moms who didn't do this kind of communication work with their previous babies, but on say their last baby, they came in and they were doing this. They've all, every one of them has said, this is different in how I can communicate with this baby compared to my other babies. And they were experienced moms. So it wasn't just that. I mean, it wasn't like it was their second baby. So they didn't know what they were doing with the first. And now they are, know what babies do a little bit more. But these were moms that had three, four or five or more babies. And they were saying, it feels different how I can communicate with this baby. This baby is calmer. I can tell when they're upset about something that's going on around them or if it's something else. Um, it makes a difference. And it makes a difference for the baby too because babies can be heard. And a child that grows up knowing that they are heard and valued for what they think or say or need or want becomes a much healthier adult. And like I said, that relationship continues. I've seen, I've watched these moms and babies as baby goes through toddlerhood and early childhood and then into their teenage years and how they communicate with their moms is different. They're much more comfortable in their skin and they're just healthier, which is what we want for everybody. So that is my favorite thing about working with pregnant women is just that moment, you know, and sometimes there's a tear when they really realize, oh, I can hear my baby. Or my baby just said, thanks, mom. I'm so glad that you're taking care of me. Or whatever it is. Um, I've, I've had some really amazing, very special experiences where one, one baby thought that mom wanted, he was a boy, thought mom wanted him to be a girl. And then she found out he was a boy and she came to see me actually that day. And she's talking about it and I'm asking her, so how do you feel about having a boy? And she's like, oh, I'm fine with it. She already had a little girl. So she's like, I'll have one of each. But this baby still, I had my hands on mom and baby and this baby still was feeling, the, the impression I got was he was feeling very unsure. And so I asked her, to tell baby how she felt about him being a boy. And she starts telling him how she's excited about this. And her dad or her, his dad is gonna be so happy that he's gonna have someone to go fishing with. Not that he, he took his daughter fishing too, but they were happy. She was telling him, we're happy that you're a boy and that you're here. And all of a sudden, I, what I felt in my hands was like waves of relief coming off this baby. like okay, I'm going to be enough. Like I'm good enough being a boy. It's, it's going to be okay. 
and I was really struck with this experience because I was thinking, how many of us are walking around carrying ideas that came from when we were in utero or little children about not being good enough or not being what we're supposed to be? And that little boy avoided that. His mom told him that she wanted him, that he was good enough being a little boy while he was in utero. And he grew, I mean, you see him now, he is the most rambunctious, outdoorsy, happy little boy. Um, and it could have been different. So it was a really positive outcome for that. So that's what I love about working with pregnant women and their babies. Since the physical aspect, what you're talking about, the pelvis and like how these can impact the ability to get pregnant. And right. I think many, many people never heard about it, never right. thought about it. So I think that's our goal here. Try to bring this knowledge to everybody and share right. and try to help as many people as we can. Because I think that I have many friends that had problems and nobody never mentioned any other um, like physical therapy in a way, like doing something physical to help, not just like hormones wise and all of that. Right. So, so I we think that's something, look at that. yeah, people don't, yeah. it's, it's just ignorance. People don't know. And it's not, right. I don't think that that's something that doctors know or probably talk about it with their clients because they probably don't know. Or I just think we, you know, you have to, to share that. So just as one quick clinical example, within the craniosacral system, you have these meningeal layers, the three meninges that line the cranial bones, come down through the spinal canal surrounding the um, spinal cord. And the, those meningeal layers then blend into the periosteum of the sacrum and the coccyx. So you have literally a direct connection from the coccyx all the way up through the spinal canal, up into the cranium and the the meningeal layer that connects to the coccyx is part of the pia mater. Well, the pia mater comes and it literally surrounds the pituitary gland. So if there is a restriction or um, somebody landed hard on their tailbone and their coccyx got shifted to the side or bent backwards or bent forwards, any kind of problem with the coccyx, that can travel all the way up into the cranium, creating a endocrine system dysfunction through that pull on the pituitary gland. So when someone has fertility issues, very few people are going and checking their coccyx. Like releasing the coccyx can release the strain on the pituitary gland. And we just, we did not know that for so long. So many people still don't know that, but that's something to check. So. Yeah, that's yeah. amazing. That's just something that I think it would be so beneficial. People know that they have other options to try, that there, there are options out there. Right. So, and in the emotional part as well, like all these things that you described that I think like most people also, they don't, don't, don't know about it or don't put enough attention or value into right. that. Thing. We don't credit it very much because yeah. our traditional medical system has separated mental from physical. But you, there are two sides of the same coin, as we all yeah. know in everyday life. But when it comes to our prof professional or clinical experience, we have to remember that it's two sides of the same coin. And I think it's a different perspective of treatment that, that the traditional RPT school doesn't teach us. So I think it gives you the ability to work on that side that traditional PTs don't know how to do that, don't have the ability to do. So I think it's just... Um, interesting to have these other options as well. I do think there are traditional PTs who instinctively do it or naturally do it because most of us got into PT because we want to help people. Having it in your head as a knowledge of this is a possibility versus your natural ability or your instinctive ability to connect with people on a different level. Um, I think we could help therapists be better at that. Hopefully, many of them are going to be listening to us and open their minds to something new, too. I was maybe thinking, that woman does not know what she's talking about, but... We are I mean, doing our part. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and now, uh, the other question will be, so how uh, about the labor, yes. delivery, and postpartum? Okay. So with labor and delivery, um, 
I've worked on hundreds of pregnant women. I haven't been in hundreds of births because that is their choice of whether, who they want. That is a very personal choice, who you want in on your the delivery, labor and delivery of your baby. But when they have been there and what we teach, um, so I do teach craniosacral therapy for the Fletcher Institute and I teach the conception pregnancy birth course for that. So, so what we teach is that labor itself is a parasympathetic activity. You know, we, we th when we think about our autonomic nervous system, we have our sympathetic system, which is our fight or flight or mobilization or get out and do things, part of our autonomic nervous system. And then our parasympathetic system is more the rest and digest, more metabolic function, right? And so labor, pushing the baby out really is a parasympathetic function. But what happens is we get increased sympathetic tone because it's, it is intense. There's no getting around the fact that this was an intense experience. I'm not discounting that in any way. So, um, but we have made it a little bit more in that fight or flight range of our autonomic nervous system function than it needs to be. And so what happens then when the sympathetic tone goes up, parasympathetic function goes down, right? It's inhibited. We know that just as how that functions physiologically. So with cranial sacral therapy, we can come in and facilitate rebalancing that autonomic nervous system function so that the sympathetic tone comes down, parasympathetic function can come back up, and the normal process of delivering this baby can occur in a more efficient, more natural way. Um, we have a technique that we call the still point, that we induce a still point. And really what that does is help to rebalance the autonomic nervous system, bring parasympathetic function back up, lower sympathetic tone. And so that can be a huge um, benefit during labor. Again, we're not, our goal isn't to have a really fast labor because that can be just as traumatic to mom and baby as a really prolonged labor, but we want it to be efficient and what's just right for that mom and baby. So by keeping them in that more parasympathetic state, we can facilitate that. Um, I didn't mention this when we were talking about pregnancy, but the other thing that we can do is really help empower mom and baby together with that communication to come up with what they want their birth experience to look like. So um, whether they want to be, so, and, and again, there's different settings for birth. So I'm going to say some things that may or may not apply to certain settings, but you can kind of generalize it across all settings. But it may be that Mom and baby think birthing in the tub would be helpful. So you can talk to them about that. And so if you are invited into someone's labor, be helping to be an advocate, like um, telling the midwife, the OB, the labor nursing staff, you know what, she'd love to get into the tub right now and help her with that. Or knowing how to um, help her change positions so she can labor in different positions that are more effective with gravity assisting her rather than laying flat on her back in the bed. So we can talk with mom and baby throughout the whole pregnancy about what they would like their birth to look like or include, or if, if possible, again, every birth plan is subject to something not going the way we want it to. And we work with that. Um, and we help mom be prepared for that. But when you're actually in the labor, helping, helping her remember, oh, you know what, maybe we should try hands and knees position or side lying, or let's go walk. Come on, I'm gonna walk with you. And you can be doing still points as you walk with them, or you can release their sacrum. One thing that we find is really, there's not a lot of clinical research on this, but there seems to be a correlation between certain cranial bones and certain pelvic bones. So for example, the temporal bones tend to mimic what the ilia are doing. And so say there's, baby just seems to be getting stuck. It feels like the ilia are not widening the way they need to um, in order for the baby's head to come through the birth canal. So you might want to come up and mobilize the temporal bones and see if you can get some ilial movement happening through working the temporal bones. Um, we call that the balancing act where you're working one, the cranial part of the body to help release the pelvis. And that can be really helpful during labor and delivery as well. 
once baby has been born, we want to leave mom, baby, dad, partners, whoever is there, that family unit, we want to give them some time to recover, to bond. That skin to skin contact with baby right next to mom is so critical. And there is um, Dr. Raylene Phillips out of Loma Linda University Hospital System in California wrote a research paper on the what she called the golden hour, where we just don't want to mess with them. That, that first introduction between mom and baby on the outside and dad or partner, whoever is there, is so vital and it is critical. Nothing, eye drops, checking the weight, all of those things are not as important as that first hour of contact between mom and baby. So we really want to educate mom about that, help encourage staff to give that to them if it's possible. Again, recognizing sometimes baby needs some care right away. And so you have to do that. But at Dr. Phillips Hospital in Loma Linda, she actually changed, they reconstructed the birthing suite so that if baby needed some kind of intervention, they put, there was a window that they could take the baby through out of the birthing room to do whatever they need to do. But their goal was to get that baby back to mom in seven minutes or less. Oh, wow. wow. So important. Like they redesigned their birthing suites to accommodate this because it's so important. Um, so I, I want to emphasize that we totally support those natural, biological, physiological needs that happen. And physiologically, what that is doing is when mom and baby are together and baby can do that breast crawl from mom's belly up to the breast, it is laying foundational blocks of their neurological system in place that if those don't get put in place, they're missing some things. So when baby is immediately taken away and put in the bassinet and then mom a couple hours later, and, and oftentimes it's out of intent, good intentions of thinking, well, mom needs to recover that's true, but mom and baby both are going to recover better if baby is right there with mom. Again, accounting for that there's not some kind of an emergency situation going on. Um, but neurologically, baby needs to go through those steps and then find the breast and latch on. And all of that is completing a biological process that is hardwired into us. And when that doesn't get a chance to complete, there's some missing pieces. And so, um, not that it's, we can't come back and help put them back in, which we can. Um, with craniosacral therapy, we do that frequently where we give them the chance to go through that process and um, do it later if it's necessary. But ideally, we don't have to do that because it happens naturally and spontaneously. But then say with baby or with mom, I mean, mom, it's an intense experience for both of them. So everything that we've talked about with the pelvis, craniosacral therapy can, can come in and help facilitate um, self-correction, healing, better blood flow, better energy flow, softening of tight tissues, all of that to help mom recover more easily. But then with baby, the, the molding that occurs in an infant's skull as they're coming through the birth canal is exactly what's supposed to happen. But when they come out, sometimes it doesn't fully come back out into a, a, a pretty shaped head. Not that we're caring about pretty, but we want it to be functional. We don't want overrides. We don't want one, um, the occiput to be rotated. That's going to create kind of a torticollis um, situation that could start at the occipital cranial base and then extend down into the SCMs, into the shoulder girdle. We want to help facilitate all of those structures, the bones, the muscles, the cranial nerves, all of that coming back into a more neutral alignment. And we can do that with cranial sacral therapy. Um, there might be the baby's head was in a tilted position all through pregnancy or even the last couple months of pregnancy. That, that could have caused some shortening on one side, some overstretching on the other, the other side. There are lots of things that can go into creating a challenge for baby physically that we can come and help, self, help them self-correct. And when you're working with a newborn, it is such gentle, it's almost an intention, but your hands are there you're giving them support, but they're a clean slate. They don't have any of these compensation patterns that adults have. And so they can self-correct really easily. An example of one thing that we can really help babies and parents with is OCB, occipital cranial base compression. So in a normal vaginal delivery, 
baby's head is going to hyperextend underneath mom's pubic bone and come out and then turn and then the shoulder starts to come out. That's in a normal, healthy delivery. It's good, but that hyperextension can create some compression of the jugular foramen at the base of the baby's skull between the, the um, foramen between the temporal bones and the occiput. And, and also we wanna remember a baby's skull, a fetal skull is in pieces. The temporal bone is in three pieces. The occiput is in four pieces. And so the little Jenga pieces can all get mixed up and we want to help them come back into a neutral alignment. But coming through the jugular foramen, we have the vagus nerve, which is the queen of this parasympathetic, that wandering nerve that goes through all of our viscera. And if that is being compressed or irritated or compromised in any way, over time, it can lead to irritation of all of the end organs that the vagus goes to, including the stomach. That's one of our leading causes of colic. And so we talk to mom, parents of babies with colic, they're desperate, baby's miserable. One or two sessions, you can come in and help self-correct that OCB and release that vagus nerve. The colic goes away. They think you're amazing, baby's happy, parents are getting sleep, the world's a better place. So that's one example of what we can do clinically with newborn. I had some experience with newborns with like refluxes and all of that. And the result is so quick. They, it's so easy to work with them, like in the sense of the results you get. Right. Right. And like it's a clean slate. So they, it corrects very easily. Very yeah. Easy. So we have to get this information to many moms to help their lives be easier. I have many yeah. friends that just had their babies. I'm going to send to all of them. And that would be great. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> hopefully you can help more people because there are so many different possibilities, as we said before, to help them in so many different ways that we don't even think about it. So it's, um, it's, uh, amazes me. That's, that's super, super interesting. Yeah. Uh, and now combining this with traditional uh, physical therapy, with the traditional woman's health physical right. therapy, how can you combine that? Do you think, do you think that they can complement each other? I think they're very complementary. Um, and I do use both. Um, going back to PT school and my elective mm -hmm. in OB, I use that material. Um, and, and then personally, having gone through labor and delivery, I, my first pregnancy was twins. I needed some recovery down there. Um, with traditional PT, you know, we're looking at the muscles, the ligaments, the alignment, the bones aligning. Actually with both of them, we're looking at all the same structures. Okay, so we're in the same area with the same focus on improving function. So that's the goal for both of them. P traditional PT tends to look more at strength, muscle balance, um, tissue mobility, and, and education, I think. Um, cranial is looking more at the fascial um, restrictions that might be there, improving circulatory flow, energy flow, releasing trauma, if that's part of the equation. Both of them are looking for balance within the whole system on all levels. We're, they're both looking to empower the woman to be more comfortable in her own skin and to know how to take care of her body better. And I think they're both um, working to educate mom on, or a woman, not just because obviously women don't have to have had a child to need PT, but a woman's yeah. PT. Um, so you're looking at all of that, educating us how to be in our bodies in a healthier way. So I do think that they're very complimentary. Nice. Um, Lynn Schulte uh, has, runs the Institute of Birth Healing. She does, she's a traditional PT who incorporates some other modalities, including cranial into her approach, but also gets in there and looks at how the psoas muscles, which in most people tend to be a challenge, men and women, but in women, particularly surrounding birth, if there is shortening on one side of, or the other in the psoas muscles, Ideally, they're symmetrical and balanced, and they actually act as a chute to direct baby down to the birth canal. But say one's shorter, and 
on one side and lengthened on the other, what it does then is it tends to put baby kind of going off into mom's hip. And we see a lot of births or bait pregnancies where baby just keeps going down to that one side. But we're not looking necessarily at the muscle. Why is that? Oh, baby just likes it over there. Well, no, maybe baby's getting pushed there because there's a psoas imbalance. So being able to look at both makes a huge difference. Yeah, that, that is really huge and could help many, many women to have like natural birth, right? Healthy births, vaginal births that are um, uncomplicated. That's the goal. Yeah. So Lynn Schulte's work at the Institute of Birth Healing is really um, a great example of integrating both of those. Nice. Um, before we transition to the final questions, do you want to like show the slides now? Or are we yeah. are on the yeah. end? That would be great. Thanks. Okay. So people that are listening to us, if they want to check what what Kim is about to show, you're going to have this podcast on YouTube as well. All right. So this first slide is showing a before and after. Um, this woman came to before and after of a cranial session. It was one cranial session, but you can look and in the slide on the left, you can see how there's almost a concavity uh, in her pelvis, mm -hmm. and then you come up to the top of her fundus and the um, higher part of her belly showing with the pregnancy. Mm -hmm. That is a restriction within her pelvis that is going to create challenges for her uterus and for the growing baby. So I treated her that day, and then she came in the next week, and you can see the difference in the curvature of her belly. Instead of that concavity, it's convex. And right down from her pubic bone, there's nice, a, a nice smooth, gentle slope of her belly. That's what we're looking for. And that would have been a big, um, it could have created dysfunction and, and discomfort but for both mom and baby. Um, there is such a thing where the uterine, uterus is restricted from growing and so the baby can't grow and it leads to lots of problems. I don't know that that would have happened here, but it definitely would have been less comfortable for both of them. Mm -hmm. All right, so the next slide, um, this is a woman and her husband in the labor room receiving cranial sacral therapy. So what I said um, about getting mobilization happening at the cranium, being able to help open up the pelvis, that's what's happening here. And, you know, you make it work by coming around the rocking chair, over the ball, in the table, um, or, or I'm sorry, on the uh, bed. We move in where we can and where it's most comfortable, always paying attention to what mom needs. Sometimes pregnant women just want everybody's hands off and that's totally great. Then you're just holding the space for them to be able to go into that parasympathetic function of delivering this baby. And, um, trusting that their body knows what to do. I think that's one of the great skills of a good therapist is knowing when to be doing something and when to sit back and let their ability to know what they need take over. All right, so that's labor and delivery. This is immediately following birth and this baby was having a challenge being able to latch onto the breast. And so you can see the therapist's hands coming in and doing a quick little release on the crane or the occipital cranial base of the baby, but we're not getting in between mom and baby. We're just there supporting them being able to connect better and baby being able to latch better, but we don't want to come in between mom and baby, particularly in those first few hours. And then having just said that, here's me holding my granddaughter. I wasn't coming between her and her mom, but her mom was in the bathroom and her, my son-in-law was helping her in the bathroom. So, um, my granddaughter was born with a tongue tie. And so there was a lot of restriction in her throat area at her cranial base. And it was a couple of weeks before we could get that tongue tie released and surgically um, with just a scissor clip. She did great after that, but doing cranial beforehand helped breastfeeding be more comfortable for both of them and more efficient. But it also prepared her so that when they clipped the frenulum, she was breastfeeding within about two minutes and did great after that. So um, anyway, it, it made a huge difference for her as far as her oral function and being able to 
be prepared for that phren uh, phrenotomy. All right, so those were the slides that I had. Uh, I think it does have to encourage people with that. People, therapists and patients. So hopefully therapists will be able to spread the word to the patients as well and right. we can get this information out there. Uh, so transition to our final questions. What are um, What is your favorite resource of information? Do you have any book or anything specific that you like? Um, I have a couple. So I did mention uh, the Institute of Birth Healing and Lynn Schulte's work, OPA, the Association of Pre and Perinatal Health and Psychology, or Psychology and Health. They have a lot of um, research and books that have been written by um, people participating in that association. For example, um, David Chamberlain wrote The Mind of Your Newborn Baby. They also have a, a monthly, actually, might be quarterly, quarterly journal that lists the most current research in bonding or what babies can do or um, breastfeeding or what happens in mom and baby or mom and dad's lives prior to birth and how it impacts baby. So there, that is a great resource. Um, one woman who is associated with APA, um, her name is Anne Diamond Weinstein, and she wrote a book called um, Prenatal Development and Parents' Lived Experiences. And it, that's what it's talking about, is how everything that mom and baby, or sorry, that the parents are going through prior to conception, at conception, during the pregnancy, what impact it has on a physiological basis in the embryo fetus. It's a fascinating book and it's very well researched and very well documented with current research. So that's a great book. John Upledger, so I do, I'm gonna make a plug here. I do teach for the Upledger Institute, but John Upledger has written several books too. Um, Cell Talk is one of them and how we can actually communicate with ourselves and the cells of the people that we're working with. So that's an interesting book. Um, Bruce Lipton's Biology of Belief is also a great book for maybe expanding our minds a little bit out of the traditional medical model into what can be possible from other perspectives. And let's see if I'm forgetting any of the ones. I wrote them down so I wouldn't forget. Yeah, I think those are the ones, the highlights. Yeah, I think we have plenty of resources, people that are interested to looking a little deeper into that. So that's good. Yeah. And what would be um, advice that you would give to the clinicians that are starting their careers? Honestly, my biggest piece of advice was would be to first follow your interests. You know, I started out 33, 34 years ago with, an interest in pediatrics and obstetrics. I never planned exactly to get here to this point where I'm teaching this material from a craniosacral perspective, but that was what I loved to do. And I love other populations too. I work with all populations, but that just, it makes me happy. And I think a happy therapist leads to successful treatment. And so, and an effective treatment. So. Follow what is interesting to you. If you are interested in geriatrics, work with geriatrics. No matter if somebody says, well, that's kind of a boring part of PT. It's not, you know, it's amazing. And, and honoring that population is what we should all be doing. Um, if it's hand therapy or burn therapy or sports, you know, whatever it is that makes you excited, that's what you should be doing. And then my other piece of advice would be to not worry about doing it the right way. When I, so when I took my first cranial class, I told you I came back and I started working or practicing. I was just practicing. And then I started getting phone calls from people asking me to practice on them. And I thought, okay, I need to make this a little bit more legal. But I was working out of my house and I had four little kids in the house. And I had a couple of people say to me, you can't practice PT like that. I was like, well, it seems to be that I can. And I did, you know, I was not a, a Medicare approved provider. I was okay with that because it wasn't a, an approved facility, um, but it didn't stop me from having a very successful practice. And, um, 
And that worked for me and it worked for my family and it worked for my whole life. So that would be some advice would be to find a way of practicing physical therapy that works for you and that works for your life because there's not one right way to do it. I know mine was definitely on the fringe of what's expected, but it worked for me and it led for, to a very successful practice. So that, those would be the two bits of advice I'd give. I think that's very true. I think everybody's always worried to do everything on the perfect way. And sometimes there are things that they just don't work this way that they should or they were expected to. So I think we have to right. learn how to deal with this during our career and try to make the best we can with what we have, right? I can give you an example of that. I was teaching a class um, about probably about a year ago. And this newly graduated PT was in my class. She was petite. She was probably 5'1", maybe 99 pounds, just very petite, but the sweetest person. She was working in a facility that was a heavily focused on manual therapy. And she was miserable because she was being told all the time, you're not going deep enough, or you're not strong enough, or you're not this, or you're not that. I was like, you know what? That probably is just not the best place for you to be working because physically you don't have the capacity to do that. It's not, she was letting it make her feel like a not good therapist. She was a lovely therapist. She had the best hand for palpating and, and feeling what was going on in the tissues, but that just wasn't the right facility for her or the right approach for her. Um, and so, you know, coming from the cranial sacral perspective with a very light touch and feeling and tuning into the tissues, she was like, okay, I can do this. And it made her feel confident and like, okay, maybe I did not make a huge mistake by going to PT school. You know, don't ever feel like that. We all have our own gifts and our own abilities and there's not one right way to manifest those or to share those. Yeah, that's um, true. And what personal qualities or abilities that you think are important to become a successful physical therapist? I truly think um, what has made me the best physical therapist was that shift from the I'm going to fix you mentality to listening to what my client and their bodies had to tell me. And we talk about communication being 85% nonverbal, just in general, right? So that means 85% of communication happens in the face and in the body. That's where we need to be listening and um, listening both with our ears and with our hands and giving people credit for knowing what's going on with them. There have been so many times I've been in the hospital or the clinic where a practitioner, not necessarily a PT, but some practitioner was rolling their eyes at what the client or the patient was saying thinking, oh, that's stupid, when really that patient was right on and they knew what was going on with them and they weren't being listened to. That is the worst characteristic that we can have as therapists. And the best one is that we listen, both with our ears and with our hands. And then amazing things happen. Yeah. So putting your own ego out of the way. You don't have to be the one that knows how to fix this person. So get being humble and listening, I think are our biggest skill assets, you know, being able to use those. And then liking people is also a good thing. Yeah, I 100% agree with you. I think if you stop and listen to them, hear them, it's going to help us a lot to be successful and to connect with them and engage them on the treatment as well. Right. Uh, so, Kim, thank you so much for participating here with us and sharing this wonderful knowledge that you have and hopefully you're gonna help many people um we are podcast here and if people are more uh interested in learning more about you or uh, maybe want to know more information about your work how they can find you um so i'm in the process of updating my website so it's not up and functional right now i do have a profile at upledger.com Actually, you can go to IAHP.com, which is the International Alliance of Healthcare Practitioners, and look me up, Kimberly Painter, and um, I have a profile there. 
can also be accessed at um, my new workplace here in Utah, which is muscleworkschiro.com. So um, those are all ways you can get find me. Okay, good. I'm going to make sure to put everything on the show notes so people can contact you if they want to. And thank you again. Again, Go ahead. I was also going to say, I'm, if someone wants to email me with a question, I'm perfectly happy to have you share my email. Okay. So it's at healthyself.net. Okay, wonderful. Okay, Kim, thank you so much for taking the time it's to talk fun. with us and educating us. Well, it's been my pleasure. <laughs>